The fire rises, my retro viewers. The Dark Knight Rises. Welcome back to Retro Rewind. In today's video, we are going back to Batman The Dark Knight Rises as we wrap up this trilogy viewing of The Dark Knight. We already did for the first time ever Batman Begins. We did a retrospective for Dark Knight like every other movie channel on planet Earth. And today we sink our teeth into the very interesting Batman The Dark Knight Rises to wrap things up. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your patience. I know we missed a week of Retro Alliance. We also didn't do a vote for our Toy Story episode of Call Sheet. That's because over on my Mr. Maddie Plays channel, we did a ton of Xbox games showcase coverage on top of a Todd Howard interview that I had to prep for over on Retro Rebound. We were building a lot of content around that news, so we were running a mile a minute, so we did have to take things a little easier here, but we're back to our regularly scheduled programming. Thank you so much for enduring the speed bump. We're back to how things are going to be as per usual. So let's begin because Dark Knight Rises is a movie that so many visuals when I think of this Dark Knight trilogy really emit from this film, but also I have this unique experience that I've never had in my entire life before or ever happen with Dark Knight Rises. And it's so funny because it's also such a blur. So growing up, I had a best friend whose mom worked at Pepsi and she would just get us into sweet gigs all the time. Like the way I got to a World Series game between the Giants and the Royals, uh, she just managed to get us tickets to that while we were out in San Francisco working for a Far Cry 4 preview event. So that's a crazy story there. So yeah, she was always hooking us up. Such a nice woman. And one of the things that we got hooked up for was an early viewing of The Dark Knight Rises. And I just had this blur in my head of taking a train and then walking into this private theater to watch a showing of The Dark Knight Rises and having my hands over my mouth like this as the movie ended and absolutely loving it. And that was like the only time I watched The Dark Knight Rises. Otherwise, whenever someone mentions Dark Knight, Dark Knight Rises, even now Batman Begins, the visuals from this trilogy really spawn from this movie. So I have this rare movie going experience that I hold very closely to my heart, even though it's such a blur now, because I'm like, where was I? What? What day was that? Like, what was going on then? Obviously, it was around the time the movie came out, but that was in my teens. And it was such a cool experience from what I can remember of it, just to be able to see a movie early. I hope one day on Retro Rewind, we'll be able to see some movies early. I'd love just to experience what things are like behind the scenes in this industry, like I do with games. But nonetheless, I already talked about, you know, hands over the mouth toward the end of the movie. Let's just jump straight to the finale, right? Where Batman, does he die? Doesn't he die? Hmm. Well, we know the decision that was made and we have a write-in about it from patreon.com slash retro revive where you can join and be part of our videos across retro rewind and retro rebound. Truly your support makes a difference. It allows us to be here, keep the lights on. So thank you for being a part of things. And this one comes from Aunt Rand who says, it's been a while, but I remember my friends and I all thinking Chris Nolan was a big bitch for making you think Batman died and then pulling the old switcheroo. Do you remember your initial reaction to this moment? Were you as upset as I, or were you just happy he was still alive? So back then, I already told you, my reaction was literally like this, hands over the face. I was stunned. I was like, oh my God, he's going to die. No, they can't kill him. They can't kill him. They can't kill him. And then you see him nod to Alfred at the end of the movie. He's hanging out with Selena Kyle. You're like, okay, great. Like, good. He's alive. Nowadays, the storyteller in me is like, this was the end. Like, this was a good time to commit, especially because he goes out in such a heroic way. You know, talking to Gordon, saying how, you know, putting that coat around his shoulders was like such a, a very important moment to him in building who he is today. And Gordon saying like, don't you want people to know who you are? And it's like, it doesn't matter. Like, he's just so giving and self-sacrificial. I think it was the perfect way for a hero to go out. So nowadays, I just feel like they should have pulled the trigger and killed him, especially since that was the end of the trilogy. Like, what better way to do it than going out on a heroic death? And it kind of solidifies that, like, Bane wins in a way, which is sort of what happens at the end of Dark Knight, where, like, Joker wins in a way. Like, Batman's not just winning, he's barely getting by. And so, as long as the people live, then Batman has truly won, but it may not feel like that for the viewer. So, yeah, Batman not dying. Back then, so relieved. You didn't know what was coming up next, but nowadays it's like you, you should have maybe pulled the trigger but i can see arguments why 
that wouldn't pan out well for some of the audience. Because as Otran puts it, it, it does feel a little like, oh, we're about to do this thing. It seems like everything in the movie is indicating like Batman should die right here, right now. This is the right way to do it. And based on what I read online, a lot of people seem a little divided on this one. Not like extremely divisive, but a lot of people aren't as crazy about it as others. I think this would have solidified the movie being in such a high spot because it, it was just a bold thing to do. The hero never really dies, especially back then. So I think it would have been cool to see, but it doesn't really fully take away from me the impact the movie has. Because again, I, I always think of that, that nod from Bruce Wayne uh, to Alfred. I, I just think of that scene all the time. It's always stuck with me since I saw it. Like one of my favorite visuals from the entirety of this trilogy. So it, it gave me that. Is that really so much of a loss? Hard to say, depending on who you are. All right, so I'm gonna expose my lack of movie knowledge here, right? And this is a bad one because at least I could say with comic book stuff, I'm pretty well versed, but this is just inexcusable, but I gotta share it anyway. So I was today years old when I found out Tom Hardy was Bane. I uh, had no clue. I'm sitting there watching the movie again, wrap things up, credits are rolling. I'm like, Tom Hardy, what? This guy, yeah, because it's so funny. I have such a weird perspective on Tom Hardy, right? Like my first real exposure to him is Venom, right? Venom, which is this hard seven out of 10 movie, but everyone shits on it, but I think it's kind of cool. I think it's kind of charming, but Venom was my introduction. Then I go over to Mad Max Fury Road. Tom Hardy doesn't talk at all. I just see a lot of his visual acting chops, right? Then I find out that I still can't see Tom Hardy in this role, but like, that's him unbelievable I had no idea this man got around so much but but tip of the cap to him for concealing his identity for so long but Bane is a very interesting part of this movie for two reasons number one the voice we have a write-in about this is from Sabi Maru probably the most obvious question but I gotta know what do you think of Bane's voice in this I personally love it but I remember it was divisive at the time it's it's hit or miss like in the CIA plane scene which is one of the best scenes in the trilogy in my opinion just the, the solidification of this villain and the extreme lengths he's going to go to to accomplish his plans and, and people who are willing to sacrifice themselves for him. And, and of course, seeing Littlefinger here with like his hands, you know, hooked onto his belt, just the confidence he's got in his stance. That's another visual that always sticks out in my head. I think it's a meme, but I, I think it's hilarious. Nonetheless, uh, Bane here and his voice I noticed it in that plane scene where the, the audio mixing is very inconsistent. You know me. Not enough of a movie buff to be out here being a snob talking about audio mixing, but if I pick up on it, then, then maybe we might have a problem here. I say that because there were just times where he was loud, there were times he was quiet, there was times he sounded really ridiculous. I don't think I thought much of the voice back then. Nowadays, I, you know, it's, a, it's a little annoying. It's, a, it's just a touch annoying. I, I do prefer the more psychotic Bane that's got you know the, the tubes connected to his neck and he's huge and muscular uh, this is a more humane bane i guess if you will not in like his behavior but like his appearance uh, so it depends on your preference of bane but for me the whole talking like this i it's more of a meme than appealing but i can totally see the charm in this and why it works for some people but it sounds like someone trying to be a villain rather than just you know actually being evil and doing evil things you catch my drift like it's very comic booky, so it works. But I would just hope in future renditions of Bane that they're more like, hey, it's about the action, not the voice trying to sell the evil part of him. But it's character defining, and I can't take that away from him. It's like, yeah, I may not be as crazy about it nowadays, but it defines his character. Like, that is a voice that is iconic because it just sticks with you. As are the scenes he's involved in. We have Dexterous Joe who writes, The fire rises, brother. For the issues that this movie has with story progression and overall send-off for Batman, the mid-air plane hijack introducing Bane and Bane vs. Batman fight was damn good. Would love to know if you all feel the same. So for me, re-watching this, the final fight scene, hmm, I, I think the climax obviously is where Batman flies away with the bomb. Obviously, that's the climax of the movie, but... I there's just a, a weird feeling about that scene for starters I don't really get this whole idea of like two leaders fighting in this empty circle while everyone else is surrounding them in their own battles it's hard for me to buy into because my brain immediately goes like why aren't you all just like ganging up on Bane or why aren't you all just ganging up on Batman uh, the fight is also a little weird like there's one point where Batman just is standing on the top of the stairs like waiting for Bane to catch up to him and this is something I've been critical of for the entire trilogy like 
you can see the improvement from Batman Begins to The Dark Knight when it comes to fight scene choreography. But I just feel like throughout this whole trilogy, I don't believe it's a real hot take to sit here and go, yeah, I'm not really in love with the general fight choreography throughout the entirety of the Dark Knight trilogy. Like there's a weird feeling all throughout and I can't help but nitpick the consistency of like the gun being pointed and not shot. By that, I mean, Batman kicks D Bane into like the courtroom at the very end of the fight scene. And this dude just shows up and, and tries to put a double barrel straight to Batman's dome instead of maybe getting a step back. Like it just sometimes has these fight scenes that defy all logic and reason. And I know I sound like I'm nitpicking and frankly, maybe I am, but it just breaks me out. And I got to document that sort of stuff. It's like, those are the things that rip me out of a movie because I'm trying to get immersed. And I see like people just behaving how things wouldn't typically go. And that doesn't really sell me on the fight. So I'm not as crazy about the final fight scene as I think others might be. What I am pretty crazy about are some of the actions Bane takes that really depict his character. One of my favorites is so subtle, but it's when Gordon discovers the underground base of Bane and he rolls into this sewage waterway and rolls completely away from Bane and all of his goons. And so Bane is clearly getting fed up. And so what he does is after being told, well, we can't find him, is he takes a tracker, slaps it into the dude's chest and he goes, follow him. The guy's about to say, follow him, what do you mean? And shoots him immediately and pushes him off and uses the tracker to find out where this all leads because wherever it leads is where gordon will end up being right i just thought that was brilliant like it's it's very much detached from the humanity of the people who work for him it's all about the cause and he has no tolerance for bs and so i just love scenes like that maybe it's not a big iconic fight scene there are fight scenes i do like in this movie we'll get into when i talk about catwoman but to me that worked really well in selling his character as does like his ability to sink an entire football stadium. This to me, I think is responsible for why I was super antisocial and anxious in high school. I had a huge rep in my friend group for just not showing up to events because I just never wanted to leave my house. And I never knew why at times I was always just enjoying being home. Like I enjoyed just the safety of my own home. Like I didn't want to go out and do much. Like I just enjoyed video games and TV. And you know, that was really it. Like that was my life for most of high school. And I've, since broadened my horizons but i think it scenes like this and this is probably why i stayed inside because like i would always get kind of anxious in big social events and i see things like the entirety of a field collapsing beneath itself and being trapped in that public scene i'm like this is my worst nightmare man like this is this is what anxious maddie at age 16 was like thinking about man it was so weirdly validating to see maybe i'm weird for that but I just think about it all the time and, and re-watching, I was like, that seems like something I used to be like afraid would happen and I would just stay home because I just had bad anxiety. So that also sold me on the, again, the absolute length this villain will go to to accomplish his goal. So I like Bane as a villain, a little bit less as the voice and holy crap, it's Tom Hardy. Who I like a little bit more is uh, Anne Hathaway be because of Catwoman, the character. Come on now. I mean, look, I love the scene where she calls in the SWAT team in the bar. I just thought her ability to just switch personalities, that's a lot of her character throughout this movie. She's wearing different outfits, masquerading as different occupations and going for big steals. And, and in this bar scene, she's fighting everyone off, opening fire and timing it out where the second the SWAT team comes in, she just drops the guy, falls down, starts screaming and lets the SWAT team carry the rest. And immediately as they pass by, shuts the switch off, immediately goes back to her calm, cool, composed self and exits the room. I, I love this type of character in any medium. There's just something about that, having it all under control, being really captivating because the moments where the mask slips a little bit, like when Batman and Catwoman team up to fight Bane's thugs. It's like the first time they're really working together. She's about killing, obviously Batman's not. And it's there that their backs are against the wall and she has to choose to dive into the Batmobile with Batman because that's the only way she's going to survive. It's there you see like a brief moment of concern on her face, which is very different from the rest of the movie where she's got it under control. She doesn't need no man. She doesn't need any help at all. And so it's in those moments that I think Catwoman is at her best. So I just love Anne Hathaway's portrayal of Catwoman. I'm not sure if there's any other popular renditions of her, but this always really worked for me. So to wrap things up, we have this right in here from Jaron Hackwith, who says, 
I do feel the movie was fantastic, but in memory, a bit of a black hole, and I can agree with that until I sat down and watched it recently. Having watched the Chris Nolan Batman films after seeing Interstellar, were there any similarities that you picked up on? Common DNA. If there's one thing that I noticed that was pretty consistent, I would call it the wide pan shot. This is where, again, my, my amateur approach to movies is a blessing and a curse to this channel. I sometimes don't know how to identify the simple things I'm seeing, but a lot of shots in Interstellar are these pulled out cameras panning over an environment as you see these other characters are pretty much like pebbles on the screen. They're so small walking along. Interstellar is full of shots like that. Batman has moments like that. I, I think about in Dark Knight where Batman's like standing on top of a building in, I, was it Tokyo? No, it was, it was Hong Kong. That's where it was. And you see the camera panning around him, just like we've seen in Interstellar. So I noticed that as a consistency. I also feel like there's just a similarity in a weird way between Matthew McConaughey and Christian Bale. Just maybe I'm galaxy braining here, but they, you could tell me they were from like the same parent cut from the same cloth and I'd believe it. Like, I feel like Nolan has a feel for these types of actors and knows how to utilize them best. Like these kind of playboy looking actors. I don't know. Like, I, I feel like there was a consistency there. Epic score being another thing. I mean, of course, the, the Dark Knight score speaks for itself, but all these movies, I, I do think, have fantastic scores, and Interstellar is still one of my favorite scores. I, I think it's way above and beyond pretty much everything I've seen thus far. So I would say score has stuck out with me. So this is a great question. I appreciate anyone who's paying attention to everything we're watching and trying to pull it all together here into Retro Alliance. I didn't really think of it this way, so I, I appreciate the writing because it challenges me to think in new ways. But yeah, Dark Knight Rises, really interesting viewing this time around. Where would I rank this entire trilogy? Of course, Dark Knight's going to be at number one. I think it speaks for itself. Heath Ledger's performance. I just think the overall story. I love the idea that Batman's technically not in the title of the movie. I know we all call it like Batman the Dark Knight, but it's really called just the Dark Knight. I admire that a lot. But I also think that Frankly, at number two, Batman Begins. I really like that movie a lot. I love the inclusion of Scarecrow. I love the theme of fear in that movie. It just was reminiscent of how I feel about the Sam Raimi Spider-Man movies. Not perfect, but the themes are clear. The storytelling methods are clear. And there's a very obvious starting area and, and where you end up is very satisfying. And also the way that Ra's al Ghul is written. I just, he's, he's a quote machine, man. Just sick writing there. And that leaves Dark Knight Rises at the bottom. I think that it's a great movie still. None of these movies are bad. I just feel like I enjoyed this one the least. I'm not as compelled by Bane as a villain. It's a really tough act to follow up after the Joker. It's like, why wasn't this guy the one ending the trilogy? It's a question worth asking. But yeah, Bane really doesn't do it for me too much. And I think there are some occasional pacing issues in the movie as you're you know waiting for the Dark Knight to really return. And there's that slow, steady buildup and you're relying on other weaker components of the movie to kind of carry things, but I can totally see why this would be someone's favorite. So ultimately, Dark Knight trilogy done. What we move on to next? Well, I'm gonna decide that shortly and I'll see you then. Keep in mind, this is like our fun, comic booky, pop culture focus series. So we'll be back with something that you've likely heard of before. Take excellent care of yourselves and I'll catch you in the next Retro Rewind. Peace out. Do remember that with YouTube's declining ad revenue, this content truly isn't possible without your support. So thank you to everyone who watched, but also to those of you who signed up on Patreon. A special thanks to our retro producers, Andrew Martinez, Anthony Garofalo, Anthony Starr, Ben is Handsome, Ben Wath, Bobby Rodriguez, Brandon Vandeman, Brendan Horton, Chris Nelson, David Portnov, Forged Horizons, Golden Goose, Jay-Z, Jeremy Schock, Justin Robinson, Kyle Corey, Luke Aldersley, Miranda Grubba, Midnight, Mr. House Jr., Nico, Noah the Otter, Ordo Boyo, Poot, Quack Sweet Feet, Rallo, Sean Mason, Sotelo 74, The Smith One, Tom Panzeca, Ty Gorgon 12, and Tyler Kaminsky. Thank you to everyone who supports what we do here. Again, we truly couldn't do this without you.